Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Aquarium of the Pacific. I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the Aquarium, and it's great to have all of you here with us this evening for this lecture. We wish you could be here in person, but this is the next best thing, and we're hoping to have you back soon. I want to thank our sponsors for this lecture series, Gazette Newspapers and the Courtyard Marriott. Tonight, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. William Bill Cooper. Uh, he is going to discuss his experiences with the Pierrella Reserve and the hundreds of species that call that reserve home. And he's going to also talk to us about efforts to expand that reserve. Dr. Cooper is a professor emeritus of civil and environmental engineering at UC Irvine, where he was also the director of the Urban Water Research Center. He previously served as the professor of chemistry and the director of the Drinking Water Research Center at Florida International University. And he was also chair and professor of chemistry at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And then he served a stint as program director for environmental engineering at the National Science Foundation. In 2011, he was elected as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and in 2014, he was elected Fellow of the Association of Environmental Engineers and Science Professors. He's a distinguished scholar, oceanographer, uh, teacher, mentor, and uh, tonight we're going to hear about what he's doing in his new world. And uh, he made the move from academia into this new domain where he is exploring the world's natural world and he's doing an amazing job of documenting it for all of us. Bill, welcome to the aquarium. Uh, thank you very much, Jerry, and I uh, appreciate the introduction. Tonight, folks, we're going to be talking about Purella and ecological rainforest paradise. So what is Purella? In 1995, William Camacho was at a turning point in his life. He could grow pineapples or bananas or raise cattle or he could do something for the environment and sustainably raise butterflies. He started with the blue morpho butterfly. In an area 20 meters by 20 meters, he brought in their food plant and started. He then sold the pupae or chrysalis to the Costa Rican entomological supply and with the proceeds grew his dream of a 20 by 20 meter uh, square to three hectares, which is 7.5 acres, of a butterfly garden named Pirella Ecological Garden. These are the blue morpho butterflies that we raise, one of about 25 species that we raise at Pirella. And they are absolutely stunning and one of the iconic species of Costa Rica. More recently, we've developed this idea of expanding Pirella, and the only way we could do that really would be to form a not-for-profit, an NGO company, and we call that Pirella Rainforest Reclamation Project. We are gonna build some additional housing capacity. Well, sorry, we're gonna, first of all, we're gonna expand the Pirella. We're gonna build a laboratory and an educational center. We will also be building additional housing to capacity to, housing capacity to for students that come to study, and that can be students of any age. The foundational goal of Purella is to educate the next generation students in our core values. The core values of Purella are biodiversity, ecosystem services, sustainability, and wildlife corridors. This is the front door of Purella. Lo and behold, you'll see that it has a blue morpho on it. And we'll take you for a trip inside of Purella in just a moment. I think you might be able to hear some of the birds in the background there. This is our kitchen and dining area. Okay, the kitchen there is over to the right. We do all of the cooking on a, on a wood stove. And as we go through the dining area, you can see here in front uh, where we make our chocolate. We grow our own cocoa and we then uh, dry it and make chocolate. And that's one of the favorite things of the kids that are visiting Pirella. 
You can see that we have quite a large place, a dining area, and that's also the wildlife viewing area. This is the stream uh, that runs through Pirella. So like everything else, we have a river runs through it. It's like a small river, but you'll see the big river that's one of our borders. But in here we have, there's a little fish in there. We have uh, three or four species of, of kingfishers that come in, in uh, actually fish in the little pond there. And you can see now the dining area up above there. And that's also the, one of the wildlife viewing areas on Pirella. As we pan over here to the left, you'll see another building up above. There are two, two apartments, and that's where I stay when I'm there. So I only have a 30-foot um, commute in the morning before William gives me my cup of coffee, which is always fun to start. And you can see the shakalakas here. They're big birds. In fact, they look like they're, they're as close to turkeys as you can get. This is everybody's favorite. This is the three-toed sloth. It's a male. He was moving from one tree or one area to another. He'd heard a female whistle. Now you can see that that yellow stripe on his back indicates that he's a mature male three-toed sloth. These are one of the interesting bats that we have. Um, these are called the Honduran white bats. Sometimes they're called the Honduran white tent bat. And those five little images shining through that heliconia leaf are little bats. They're about the size of a golf ball. And you can see they're just as cute as can be. And they're very skittish. So we have to be very careful when we're photographing them. I have, I sometimes lay on my back to get my camera up so I can actually photograph these butterflies, these butterflies, these moths. Ugh. The bats. Here is a second kind of tent bat. This is called the pygmy fruit eating bat. And these are really cute little guys. And you can see that here they've actually cut the tip of the leaf off and it falls down and then creates a home for them. And here's two of them hanging on for dear life during the day, wondering what on earth that big eye is that's looking at them. And that's my camera. Uh, in a second here, you'll see that there's actually three huddled together in their little house. This is a laughing falcon. It's a snake eating bird. He thinks that, that I might be a snake, but I'm a little bit too big for him, so he doesn't bother me. But he flew in uh, and he started making a noise and William said, oh, that's a laughing falcon. And uh, so I ran out and he was very, very accommodating. He let me sit there for 10 or 15 minutes and photograph him. Um, and this is what we mean, one of the things we mean by wildlife corridors. The fact that Pirella is there in the middle of houses and everything, but yet it's a rainforest. There are species like this, and you'll see the scarlet macaw and great green macaw in a bit, that come in and make Pirella home for a day. Oh, look at that, here's the scarlet macaw. This is an interesting story. This is the first time William has seen the scarlet macaw at Pirella in the 25 years he's been here. And one thing that we're hoping to do is to be able to talk to people in the government and when we start to enlarge Pirella, one thing we would like to do is to try to get a, look at that, try to get a population, a resident population of these scarlet macaws. We have a second macaw, which is the scarlet macaw is the biggest, and here comes a green macaw, watch this. The green macaw is also a magnificent bird. I have to say the scarlet is just a tad bit cuter than, than the green macaw, but I'll show you this guy when he, going to get a chance to, to see them out of leaves. These birds are the biggest parrots in, uh, in Costa Rica, the, the macaws, um, and they are make a racket. When they come early in the morning, it'll wake you right up. Here you can see the great green macaw with its beautiful blue and red. It is an absolutely magnificent bird, and yet it is so camouflaged, I have a hard time photographing it in those leaves. Here's one of my favorites. Whoops, did we miss that wing clap? This is the white collared mannequin. There's about 54 species of mannequins and I've been fortunate enough to actually film uh, almost uh, a terabyte of white collared mannequin behavior. And this is the dancing nest of the white collared mannequin. 
and they will dance. And then in that area, they will then attract a female. And uh, sometimes the, the female likes the male and they will mate. And sometimes she doesn't and she just flies off. But I have that whole thing on my YouTube channel. No, it's not on my YouTube channel. It's too long for my YouTube channel. But I have a 30-minute video on the white-collared mannequin. This is one of the most beautiful of the four species of hummingbirds. This is the white-necked male Jacobin hummingbird. Look at that blue head. Have an interesting story about this guy, or at least one of his friends. Uh, this last year, we found a, a, a Jacobin hummingbird nest with two eggs in it, and the male was the only one sitting on the eggs. The female, uh, we thought actually that the female was the one that would sit on eggs, but in this case, it turned out it was a male. So we've actually made what we thought for Pirella an interesting uh, discovery. These are leaf-eating ants. So in order to see these guys, we have to get out at night. And this is me photographing with my with flashlights on there. And you can see these little ants. And this is their fungus forest. So this is underground. Well, it's not underground. It, it was something that William built, actually, for them. But you can see here, I don't know if you can see my thing. This is where the decaying leaves are. What happens is then this fungus grows, this white stuff is fungus, and that's what the ants eat. So the ants harvest the leaves, the leaves then end up growing a fungus, the ants eat the fungus, and then they continue their life cycle. This is a magnificent picture of a bromeliad. It's a large bromeliad. Uh, that stalk is just about a meter in size, um, so you can see that that's amazing. And one of the reasons I'm bouncing back and forth between plants and animals, and we'll get some we'll get some lizards in here in a little while, is that remember 25 years ago this was a pasture. All of these trees have been planted and grown to maturity in 25 years. Here's another iconic species of Costa Rica, the red-eyed frog, and this happens to be a male, and the male and the female are absolutely beautiful. But this guy is an amazing thing. Look at those colors under his legs. You would never have guessed that. I yearn to have uh, sneakers that are the color of his feet, a nice orange sneaker. Now watch this. He's going to jump, and he's, he's going to watch a leaf until he knows that he can jump from that into a leaf, and then you'll see him hanging on that leaf in the background. This is him. Well, there he goes. See him hanging in there? There he is. He's hanging. There he is. Now he's on the leaf, and he'll spend the rest of the day there, and then at night he'll start moving around. They're usually nocturnal. This is one of three honey creepers. This is called, surprisingly enough, the red-legged honey creeper. This bird, when it's ready to start mating, changes its plumage from, you'll see uh, uh, males that are, that are in the non-mating plumage, but this bird is one of the most beautiful birds there is. And here are a couple of, these are the non-breeding plumage. You see, it's just a plain green. But you can imagine that obviously there has to be something that gives that male an advantage by expending all that energy just to completely come up, up with a whole new plumage. Oops, sorry. This is the green honey creeper, a magnificent bird. And we'll see the female here in a bit. Um, but... Uh, when you start photographing these things, and I'm using a, a, a 4K camera, when you start photographing these things, every day there's a surprise for you at Pirella. And I wake up, I never know what I'm going to be photographing that day, unless it's going to be something like the white-collared mannequin. Um, but you can see this is a beautiful bird, the green honey creeper. And here's the female. The female is... is green because she's the one that's going to be doing most of the work as far as uh, laying on the eggs in the nest and she wants to be as camouflaged as possible. Here's the male shine, shining honey creeper. So this is the three honey creepers that we have and they're in the book, uh, the bird book that I use, they're actually very closely related to or next to the tanagers, although I don't know if they're actually considered a tanager.
So now we're going to change to a plant. This stained glass palm is very unique and it's very, very, very rare. It's only found in the Braulio Carrillo National Park, which is up on the mountain um, to the west of us, and a little bit in Nicaragua. The fellow that has written a paper on this, um, we've gotten connected and he's going to meet me in Pirella um, on uh, in November, and he's going to be part of my scientific advisory board because he's an expert in plants. I honestly um, don't know anything about plants, but the stained glass palm is pretty impressive. These are the collared aracari, and they're toucans. And there's going to be eventually about five of them here. They, again, are beautiful birds. I also have the other toucan here. We have two toucans. Uh, on the, the site. But these guys, we found their house. They had a new house this year right behind where we eat. So I actually got some photographs of them coming in and out of their house, although it was very difficult to photograph. I had the camera set up for hours before I actually got some photographs. But you can see that they love um, the bananas here. And the problem, not the problem, one of the facts is that these aracaris, the toucans are not particularly loved by other birds because they they can rob baby ba baby birds out of the nest. I don't know if you could hear it, but the Montezuma's oropendula is one of the most unbelievable birds. And let's see. This is known as oropendula gymnastics. That's the chick on the right and the adult on the left. And watch what happens with this huge chick in a minute. I'm not even sure I was watching this when I photographed it. I had my camera set up. So the chick is going to start doing a typical bird kind of trick. That and that is he's going to start playing with his wings adult, which is and he's going to look for... In birds. And when the chick is interested in being fed, it will flap its wings like this and then the adult will feed it. And here it is eating bananas like crazy and still is, as long as mom or dad are there, uh, he'll try to get a free meal. This is the chestnut headed oropendula. And I was photographing this thing and I said, that just doesn't look like the Montezuma's oropendula. So luckily we had the bird book right there. You never go down there without a bird book, a butterfly book, an animal book, um, a lizard book and all of those things because the, William knows most of those things, but he's usually out and about. Do you see that bird on the lower right-hand side of your screen? That's the national bird of Costa Rica. It's called the clay-colored thrush. And it's not because it's beautiful. It's because the song of the clay-colored rush is unbelievable. And that's why it became the national bird of Costa Rica. Now, I want you to look here. We've got three trees. We've got a tree here. We've got a tree here. And we've got a tree here. This is the tree I want you to focus on because it's cut off up at the top. And it turns out that it's hollow. And way down here is where the white crowned parrot has a house. So this little wood creeper, the cocoa wood creeper, asks, looking down the hole, is anybody home? And then there's another wood creeper. So there's two different species of wood creepers. This is the plain brown wood creeper. Yep. This is our home, and here comes the white crowned parrot. I have to tell you, these are also spectacular birds. Come up very cautiously. This whole thing was photographed over a matter of 30 minutes, so I've cut it down. Um, I was only given 45 minutes for my talk, and I have about 100 hours of video, so we had to, had to do some cutting. This is one of them and watch this as they take off. Oh my God, look at that. Absolutely spectacular. This is the emerald basilisk. So uh, in Costa Rica, it, basilisks are lizards, okay? The interesting thing about this guy, there's a couple of white jack, uh, uh, Jacobins, hummingbirds that just flew in. Look at the length of that tail. It's twice as long as the body. And these Lizards are one of two or three different species that are known as Jesus Christ lizards because they run so fast that they can literally run on the top of water. And it's amazing to watch these guys. You can see how 
long his back legs are, his feet, toes are actually quite uh, separated, and he can run fast enough that he can run on the top of water. Now, when we, you might ask, well, what the rainforest? This is a rainforest. When it rains down there, about all you can do is sit back and watch it because it's too wet outside the bay. But it's something that is important for the rain, for, for the forest itself. This is a cute little guy. Um, when we, when it rains, these little spiny glass frogs actually start to sing like they do in my backyard here in Northern Florida. But in this case, William is so good at knowing what these are. He says, oh, there's a glass frog out there. So he went out and found it at night and caught it and brought it back. And why they're called glass frogs, as you'll see in a minute, at night, here's another little guy. Um, I don't think that's the same frog. This one looks skinnier. But look at when, when you shine a flashlight through the leaf that he's on, you can actually see the bones. Look at the bones here. You can see the bones in his legs. I actually looked very carefully. He didn't need to have any legs set uh, because he didn't have any broken bones. This is one of our two species of poison dart frogs. Poison dart frogs uh, are found in Central and South America, and they get their name because the natives would listen. He's 40 feet away from me. I've got my telephoto lens on, so he's 40 feet from me. Poison dart frogs have got poison in their skin that the natives um, in South America, particularly, um, would actually use that in order to put on their darts. And then when they darted a monkey or something like that, the monkey would die. Actually, at the aquarium, I heard a, a, a woman from UT Austin give a fantastic talk on poison dart frogs some time ago. And there's one species of poison dart frogs, the yellow one in Brazil, that has enough poison on it to kill 10 people, which is, to me, amazing. Here's our other poison dart frog, and we call him the commander. Um, you can see it's really called the green and black poison dart frog, uh, but we call him the commander because of his camouflage skin. And uh, this guy you'll see walk, uh, uh, jumping around a lot more frequently than you will the little uh, blue jeans. The reason, that, by the way, the other one was blue jeans is because it's got a red body and blue legs. But this guy is, is uh, jumping through the leaves here. I was kind of surprised that he didn't. There comes an ant down here a little while later. I thought maybe he might eat it. But apparently the, the poison from these that's on the frogs is from the food that they eat. And then there are deposits on their skin, uh, some of the more poisonous ones, that then uh, is what leads the, the poison dart frog. Here comes the ant, but he disappeared. And I thought, well, maybe this guy would get him. Now, this is, um, we saw earlier, a three-toed sloth. We have two-toed sloths and three-toed sloths. This guy, during the day, has a rough life. Um, he does nothing but sleep. The two-toed sloth has got two toads on its front legs and three toads on its back legs, so you have to be careful there. But the difference is the two-toed sloth always needs a haircut. And uh, here he is. Hanging on, he's sleeping. He's got a couple of legs up there, and then he gets a scratch. So his lower, his hind leg, actually goes up and scratches the scratch on his. You can see there's three toes on the scratching leg, and then there's two on the other. He says, oh my god. He says, I'm really having problems tonight. As long as you are, are aware that he's there, he or she, and I don't know if this is a male or female, they, will, they, they don't get upset if you're close, um, but you just have to give them their space. Now, I, I talked about wildlife corridors, biodiversity, ecosystem services, sustainability, and wildlife corridors. It's actually important as we fragment the land by buying it and converting it to human houses, 
it's important that we allow wildlife corridors there so we can get so that animals can move from place to place. And these rivers in Costa Rica, on the side of each river, 15 meters on either side of dry land, is belongs to the people. It does not belong to anybody else. So you cannot uh, own right up to the river. And that becomes a very, very good wildlife corridor. Um, in fact, when we were down there this last time, we found an ocelot for the first time. It's a small cat. Uh, and Kevin, my friend from Maryland, actually got a photograph of it. He was out with William. Um, and then one night, they were leading a night tour, and they found the ocelot sitting lying, actually, on a, on a tree that had crashed down over a river or a stream. This is the black mandible toucan. I kept hearing this thing in the thing. I could never understand why, what it was. We can hear this guy through the entire three hectares. Oh, this is a great story. So this is the green iguana, species iguana, genus iguana. And when these guys, it's a male, and when these guys are mating, they forget that they're 40 or 50 feet up in the, up in the sky. So watch what happens here. Here's a, a, a blue gray tanager eating the bananas and then listen. What on earth was that? That iguana fell out of a tree that was 40 or 50 feet high. And what they do, this thing's probably five kilos, so it's 10 to 12 pounds. What they do is when they fall down, they actually inflate their lungs so that they don't actually get hurt. So he's walking away as if nothing happened. Uh, the next day, another one fell out of the tree. And uh, I, called, uh, I called up Houston and said, Mission Control, we've got a problem. We're raining iguanas down here. One of the things that's really exciting is we have nine different species. Oops, I'm sorry. We have nine different species of um, orchids, and we haven't really done an extensive orchid inventory, but that same fellow that I told you is a palm expert. He has people at his university there that are experts in, in orchids. So we're gonna get some people down here this next year to see if we can start to identify the orchids. We have at least nine different species that we identified. I had a friend of mine from Toronto, or sorry, from near Niagara Falls, Canada, um, down, and he, he's a, uh, a bird person, I'm uh, sorry, a plant person, and he helped us identify some of them, but we're not sure exactly some of the identifications, but we're hoping to, to do this uh, in a more thorough way. Look at this little guy. Those are, those are all flowers. That's the flower right there, six millimeters in diameter. Look at this one. It's a really complex flower. Orchids, by the way, are the most advanced angiosperm, that is flowering plants, known. This silver-throated tanager is magnificent. Here he comes. See that silver throat on there? At first, I couldn't figure out what that was. Didn't take me long. To, I knew it was a tanager from the, just the size of him. Um, so I looked in my book, and sure enough, it said silver throat or tanager, and that's exactly what this is. Here's one of your little kingfishers. This is a male green. We also have the American pygmy. And we've actually also had the bigger one, which is a, um, I think it's a striped or collared uh, kingfisher. But this little guy, it's raining out. He couldn't care less if it's raining. But watch him bob. All of the kingfishers that I've photographed actually bob. I don't know why that is, unless it helps them with their direction of their eyesight so that when they see a fish in the water, because a lot of times you'll never even know these guys are up there in the trees because they're so well camouflaged that you didn't even know they're there until they dive down and catch a fish and then go back up into the tree.
This is a yellow-crowned euphonia. When these things, they're so small, they actually look at first like a hummingbird. Um, magnificent. I mean, just absolutely magnificent. Uh, and these guys are really, when they're molting, I have a hard time. Oh, there's the female. Um, and I have a hard time telling who it is when they're molting. That's really, I'm not a bird person. I'm getting to be, um, but it's, it's certainly interesting and fun. Here's the black cowled Oreo. That's one of the easiest ones to, to identify uh, with its distinctive yellow bands. Okay, now this, when you're down there, we have the black howler monkeys. Now they're not always there, but when they're there, you don't have to set your alarm clock because these are howling. <laughs> the only problem this time was it was three o'clock in the morning that they were howling. They were living in the tree right above where I was sleeping. Uh, there was a big, huge tree up there in the whole a family of these black howler monkeys was right up in there. It's been reported that these black howler monkeys have one of the largest calls in the uh, uh, native native lands, if you will. Okay, so this is a lineated woodpecker. It's a female. Uh, it's the same genus as our pileated woodpecker here in the United States. And she has found a tree that's got tons of ants on it. So she's actually cleaning up the ants on that tree. I don't understand the coloration, the coloration, coloration on her belly. It's actually quite gray and it's usually much prettier color than that. But you can see if we get a second, you may not be able to see. The way you can tell the male from the female is the amount of coverage of that red pilus on her head. And that's why we call them up here the pileated. They have, we have the lineated woodpecker, which is the same as our pileated woodpecker. And we have the same species as our extinct woodpecker, which is in the south central of the United States. I've forgotten what the name of it is, but uh, you might know that. Here's a Hoffman's woodpecker. Look at this guy, this is beautiful. He's got a little yellow back on his neck and he's got a red cap on his head. Called the Hoffman's woodpecker. I think you're probably getting a, a sense that we here at this little three hectare uh, rainforest have really got an unbelievable diversity of animals. Here's the cinnamon woodpecker. One morning they were just outside of my my room and they were and he was doing this, uh, but actually I was he, he thought he was waking me up, but I was already up. They do that to announce their presence in the area. So this is a male, and he would be doing that to see if there's a female around that might be interested in using this house for a shared house. These black-cheeked woodpeckers are so much fun. This is a female and she's working on the nest. The male will come down here in a minute and say, okay, honey, it's time for you to go to get some, some food and I'll take over cleaning the nest. See how they use their tail for stability. Here comes the male. And there she goes, and then he'll take over working on the nest. The unfortunate ending of this particular story was that they got a beautiful nest made, and then two parakeets came in and stole it from them. So uh, then they had to go off and find out somewhere else. This is a fasciated tiger heron. Unbelievable bird, you know, you the great blue heron. This thing actually is bigger, taller than the 
blue heron in the United States, and it is absolutely magnificent. We have here what we call the Cayman Pond, uh, but it dried up uh, in 2019, and the Cayman that was in there went back to the big river. Um, I did see one walking around uh, this last time, but uh, it didn't return to the pond, but now the pond's full. And that crazy heron will go up in the, up there in the stand and, and watch. This is the dance of the rufous-tailed hummingbird. This is in slow motion, so it's going to be kind of, it may look a little strange to you, but there comes the hummingbird. Look at the iridescent green when the sun's shining through. And I put it in slow motion so you could try, ooh, there he flares his tail. He'll come down here in the middle and say hi to you in just a second. Here he comes. But I wanted you to be able to see what these things look like in slow motion because it, when they're going regular speed, it's almost impossible to see what they're doing. This is a molting Passerinus tanager. I think I'll show you a Passerinus tanager in just a second. But this is this is the one that just driving me crazy when I was trying to identify it because it doesn't. It's a male, but it doesn't look at all like the adult because the adult is actually black. With this, what really is the giveaway is this uh, red rump here. You can see the red-legged honey creeper up here on the right. And as he flies, look at that red rump. There's no question about it. Here he is again. <clears throat> Having trouble standing on that tree. How on earth do you get a grip? I've often asked that of myself. So here's the male, adult male Passerini's tanager. It is absolutely black with this beautiful red uh, on, the, on, its, on its rump. And look at that white um, beak. Those are the identifying marks, that red. Uh, you can't really mistake, mistake a, a male Passerini's tanager for anything but a Passerini's. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I think we've actually made it within our 45 minute uh, Time frame. What I've done here is I just, it's the end, but it's not really the end. I'm only beginning down there. The Purella Rainforest Reclamation Project, we should have our 501c3 done in about a month. If anybody, and i sorry that that blue doesn't show up very well, but my contact information, you can get it from the, the aquarium, or my email is just wcooper at uci. Dot edu. I'll give that to you again, and we're not going to disappear from here, so you can copy it off here. W. Cooper at uci.edu. If you email me, please put in the subject Purella or Long Beach Aquarium Talk so that I know what it is. I get 150 to 200 emails a day. 99% of them I just dump. But if I have something that says Purella in it or, or the aquarium lecture, then I will get back to you. So again, it's just wcooper at uci.edu. So as an emeritus professor, I'm allowed to keep that uh, UCI email forever. I have an Instagram account, which is Bill Cooper Science. And just this morning, I put up um, a picture of a, a, a deer, a doe, with a little fawn running around my backyard. And I have a YouTube channel that is all about Purella. We have 240 videos. Um, I can give you a link to that if you send me an email. I've got it hot linked, or you can go to William James Cooper space dash space YouTube, and you can get to me that way. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. I hope you have enjoyed this. I hope you understand why it's my passion to do work down there because of this beautiful little rainforest uh, paradise, uh, rainforest island paradise in Horquetas de Serapiki. Jerry. Bill, thank you very much. That's a, a, amazing photography, and uh, this is a very important hotspot for biodiversity, and we all have to be concerned about the loss of biodiversity. Estimates are that we could lose a million species by the end of the century, and we could lose half of all species uh, within a, a few centuries. And so I think what you're doing is very important. But I have to ask you, here you were, you were a distinguished academician, a well-known oceanographer. 
and you abandoned it all to go study sloths, birds, butterflies. And I remember when I left academia to go to a, 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 the aquarium world, one of my colleagues, and more than one, said, poor Jerry, he's lost his way. Poor Bill, did you lose your way, or was this part of your grand plan for a, a long time? Well, well, thank you, Jerry. So I, I thought you might ask that question, and I, and I wanted to remind you and other people that I actually started my uh, scientific career at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and published my first paper in 1967. And then I published, and that was as an undergraduate. And then I actually did my senior undergraduate thesis up there and published that in deep sea research. I worked for a world famous organic geochemist, which at those times were people that studied things like the origin of oil and the origin of coal and the basically the fate and transport of chemicals in the environment. And one thing that, so it was only Max in the lab with a postdoc a full-time technician in me. So I had access to one of the world's top organic geochemists. And we had many, many, many discussions. And, and I think we got along very, very well. Um, and one time I said, you know, I think I want to become a scientist. And he says, well, Bill, he says, really being a scientist is not hard. He says, if you can accept 14 days of de defeat or experiments that go wrong and one day of success, uh, you, you make a good scientist. Well, it's actually, for most normal people, it's probably 21 days of success and <laughs> one day of failure. But he also said, Bill, he says, for the future, always think about a project that you would like to be doing. And you can't imagine, here I am, a junior, senior in, in college. I thought, you know, one thing that's always puzzled me is, why do grasshoppers spit look brown? And the other thing that puzzled me was, the, the, the mucilaginous membrane on, on worms. So I told him that, and of course he laughed, but I think now actually having studied aquatic systems, I think the reason that, that the uh, grasshoppers spit is brown is because they're actually it's the same process that we see in our brown waters. And, and they have they, their, their stomach actually chance, transforms those green grasses into brown stuff. And, and of course he didn't, really think too much of my mucologi mucologist membrane on, on worms. But I've, I noticed about 10 years ago that people were actually studying those because of the fact that that might give us a clue how worms and how people could get along with toxic soils. But so, that's a long way around answering your question. <laughs> I've always had an interest in sustainability, climate change, and when I... And, and you know that I actually started doing butterfly photography back in about 1972 and went to Iguazu Falls um, five different times and have photographed over 25,000 butterflies of Iguazu Falls and, in fact, even have a book on that to that name. But I've always been an interdisciplinary person, but now the existential threat of climate change has gripped me and a lot of other people. And I really, really am concerned about my children and my two beautiful little grandchildren who aren't so little anymore. How are they gonna survive if we don't start to do something and something fast? So the Purella Ecological Garden, when I went down there, I fell in love with the rainforest. I fell in love with William and Cristal who own the rainforest. And we have become almost like just family. Well, I think we are family. And so what we're trying to do now is we're trying to enlarge Pirella to make sure that at least in our area there, we want to go from three hectares to maybe eight or 10 if we can do that there. But we've also got three hectares up in the Braulio Carrillo forest that William owns, and we're going to be purchasing more land. And hopefully so we can start to reconstruct uh, secondary rainforest. We want to be able to take that pasture land in particular, like William did, in 25 years, he's made an island paradise out of pasture. So that's kind of the motivation. Bill, I think, the I, like you, I have a concern about what our children and grandchildren, what kind of a world they will live in. And one of the things that troubles me is so many young people are totally disconnected from nature. And um, we have to figure out ways to get them reconnected with nature. Not everybody is going to get to go to uh, Costa Rica 
but we can bring these images to them, and, and uh, that maybe is the next best thing to do. And so when I think there are two other lessons I draw from this. Number one, there's life after retirement. And number mm -hmm. two, most of us will have several careers during our lifetimes, and, and uh, we're not, we shouldn't feel that we're locked into doing one thing. You've had several careers within academia, and now a totally different life. Comment on the, uh, the, those inflection points in your career. Yeah, so I think that the inflection points, well, first of all, when, when you're standing up in front of a bunch of freshmen and you're lecturing, they think that you just went to college and then you decided to become a professor and your life was a professor. Uh, but that's not quite that simple. And, and I think that the inflection points, first of all, being an oceanographer, you end up being an interdisciplinary person. You have to know geology, you have to know biology, you have to know chemistry. And now uh, biology is 90% chemistry when you get into genomics. I mean, that's really a lot of chemistry. Um, geology, of course, the big thing was tectonics, which when I learned physical geology in undergraduate and then took physical geology in my oceanographic program, that whole field had changed. Um, but I see change happening. But the other thing is, once you become a dedicated scientist, what does it really mean? It means you are observing different phenomena. So whenever I was going through my career, for example, I remember back in the 19, late, mid-1995, something like this, this chemical MTBE came along. And that was the oxygenate that was added to uh, gasoline to uh, decrease knocking, get rid of lead, and also increase the oxygen. And I said, that's going to be a big problem. It is a big problem. But we solved that problem. Now, the biggest environmental chemistry problem, I think, are these perfluorinated compounds. These compounds that go into making things like Teflon. Teflon is unbelievable. Unfortunately, there's about 7,500 chemicals that are now fluorinated and have found their way into the environment. And because they're so stable, they're going to be there for thousands of years unless we can learn to get rid of them. And the, the project that we're actually, a proposal that I'm leading the way on here at the University of Florida uh, to the National Science Foundation is looking at a new technology to destroy these perfluoro compounds without having to use plasma and high temperatures. So... There's an excitement about something like this. I can't stop being a scientist, but I equally get as excited you can see about being in the rainforest. So I've already planned on going down the rainforest uh, for the month of, of November if I can get out of the United States and get down to Costa Rica and they'll let me in uh, due to coronavirus. But I'll just, I'll just quarantine myself in the rainforest and be happy. And that's also science, being a keen observer uh, and describing what you see is a very important part of science. Bill, well, thank you for a terrific, terrific lecture. And we'll get you back sometime to talk about the next phase in your career. I want to welcome everybody to come and join us on July 8th. John Sabo is going to be talking about the Mekong, the Mekong River and Delta. And he's going to be focusing on food security. Millions of people depend upon food from the Mekong River and from the Delta where much of the rice is grown for Vietnam. And yet there are dams upstream, mostly in China, where there is the capacity to take all of the water out of the river before it ever reaches the Mekong Delta. Join us and hear that amazing story. Good night.